Hello everyone, it's Lixi, and today I have a paint tool side coloring tutorial for you guys. But just a disclaimer before we get started. This tutorial won't actually teach you how to draw or pick colors, but rather a specific coloring style that I've developed and would like to share with you all. If you would like to learn how I went from this to this, please continue watching. So because this is a coloring tutorial, you will need to have line art and flat colors ready to go if you want to follow along. If you don't happen to have any unfinished art laying around, I've actually included a link to my sci files for this particular drawing, which will have all the colors on separate layers. Feel free to download it and recolor any portion of the drawing to follow along. Alright, let's start with the tools and layer modes. The tools we'll be using in this tutorial will be the airbrush tool, the marker tool, and the brush tool, separated into brush 1 and brush 2 for convenience. And for this coloring method, you will also need to understand what the multiply layer mode does, as well as some other layer functions. As there are many tutorials online that explain this, I will only give a TLDR for the sake of time. In Paint Tool Sci, the default layer mode is normal, which means the colors will appear on the canvas exactly the way it appears in your color picker. But when you set the layer mode to multiply, the color becomes darker and acts as a shadow that will be casted over all the colors underneath. Something to note about this function is that the color will look a lot more dark slash saturated. So when you're selecting a multiply shadow color, go for something that is lighter and less saturated to combat that. This function is really handy because the shadow is a little bit see-through, which allows you to keep all of the nuances and gradients of the original layer as long as the multiply layer is above it. This makes the drawing, in my opinion, much more interesting and enjoyable to look at. The two other functions are Clipping Group and Lock Slash Preserve Opacity. These functions just help us keep the colors within the lines for a neater finish and the end. To explain the method more easily, I've broken it down into five major steps. And because this method can be applied to almost any part of the drawing, I will be playing a demo for both skin and hair while explaining each step in detail. So step 1 is pretty self-explanatory. I just airbrush different colors onto the base of the drawing. I do this because it gives me something to work with in the next steps and I want to achieve some really soft transitional tones such as blush on the cheeks. I'm airbrushing the colors on the same layer because at this point there really isn't much of a need to separate the two colors from each other. Then, I take the marker tool and add some soft shadows such as the redness around the eyes and eyelids. This step is used more frequently when drawing skin because the forms are a lot rounder which leads to softer shadows. After the soft shadows, clip a new layer on top and set it to multiply. This will be where the majority of the shading is done. Use the larger brush tool to draw in the shadows where you see fit but remember to use different shapes according to what part of the drawing you are shading. For example, the skin is shaded mostly with curves and rounder shapes as opposed to the hair. After all the shadows have been added, lock that layer and start airbrushing some different colors onto the shadows. I found that airbrushing teal onto skin especially can make it look a lot more realistic. And finally, just pop on some highlights with the smaller brush tool where the light would be most reflected slash concentrated. Try not to go too overboard with this step as sometimes less is more. Now, let's see how that process works on a different part of the drawing, such as the hair. Step 1 for hair is usually done to create hue variation and not so much precise shadows. If the airbrush tool isn't big enough, feel free to use Ctrl T to make the airbrush colors larger. This step for hair can be much more subtle or even skipped at times, as most hairstyles lack roundness and can be defined mainly through step 3. For the hair in step 3, I'm doing the exact same thing but using more of a zigzag pattern while the skin has more rounded shapes. This step, as well as step 2, can be repeated multiple times to add more dimension and darker shadows. You will see me do this a lot in the speed paint breakdown. Mm -hmm. 
In this step, you can darken the overall shadows by airbrushing a darker, more saturated color. Some other tips could be airbrushing the bangs near the face with a bit of skin tony colors while using red undertones for the hair near the cap. I really like this step because it has that extra bit of detailing which can really make a difference in the final product. And lastly, when applying highlights to the hair, try to make a ring-like shape instead of placing them randomly. This will help establish a better sense of form and a neater look overall. And here is the finished product from the two demos. Now, I have a speed paint from a recent Draw This In Your Style entry that I completed on Instagram. I thought that it'd be interesting to break down exactly which step I'm on throughout the entire speed paint. And as I've said before, I will have the uncompressed art file in the description below, so feel free to download and follow along. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the tutorial section, and I hope that it's been helpful. I really want to make more tutorials like this, so some feedback would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next one.